reaching Black Hawk in 1872, Georgetown in 1877, and Central City in 1878. When the Union Pacific learned of the silver strikes in Leadville in 1879, it leased the Colorado Central and planned to use it to establish a route west of Georgetown to Leadville. But the Union Pacific abandoned the idea when it realized how formidable this part of the continental divide was. The Union Pacific had already built the engineering marvel, the Georgetown Loop. And uh, and nine miles of new track west of Georgia. After that, construction stopped. As the narrow gauge railroads reached the mining areas, the price of food, coal, and supplies plummeted, as did the cost of hauling ore to the smelters in Denver and other smelters around the state. Colorado's economy boomed, but when President Grover Cleveland oversaw the removal of the Sherman Silver Purchase Act in 1893, the balloon silver and railroad market in Colorado's economy cratered almost overnight. Mines closed, never reopened. Railroads went bankrupt or abandoned lines. Banks failed. Whole populations of towns like St. Elmo disappeared when the homeowners went to the general store and gave its owner their house keys, leaving all their possessions in their houses and left, never to return. A man who witnessed that depression told me the 1893 depression was sharper and deeper than the Great Depression of 1929. The destitute would walk the railroad tracks. And when they turned towards your house, it was the custom to step outside and yell, no food, no food, to turn them back. He said there were no jobs, and no one had food. The mining areas and the narrow gauge systems never came back. Denver learned how dangerous a single product economy was and set out to diversify. Traffic jams are not new. Chicago had horse and trolley jams in 1909. This is a trolley jam in Los Angeles in 1911. In 1906, an artist envisioned a new transportation system that was based on motorized vehicles and improved roads. It was an idea whose time had come. And when automotive companies and civil engineers implemented the, this idea, it supplied a major part of the economic diversification Denver was looking for. Neither horses nor trolleys nor trains offered the economic efficiencies of motor vehicles. It is amazing how rapidly the United States acquired motor vehicles. In 1900, there were 8,000 automobiles in the United States. In 1915, the total registered vehicles was 2.5 million. In 1916, it was discovered that the truck was 16 times more efficient than the horse and wagon. This insight spread quickly. In 1917, there were 391,000 motor trucks. One year later, the number had grown to 605,000. Historically, roads had been built and maintained haphazardly. Before the 1920s, they were built for horse
horses and wagons and tra then traveled at four miles per hour and hauled three tons or less. These roads deteriorated under the impact of heavy motor trucks that carried eight to 12 tons at speeds of 20 miles per hour. Trucks were loaded to the capacity of their engines, not the capacity of the road. Trucker's rule was, if you have a space, fill it. In the 1910s, grassroots associations like Denver Motory formed the Joint Good Roads Association and politically advocated for new and better roads. Funding was a major problem. In 1919, Coloradans got a one cent gas tax. In 1921, the State Highway Department was created. In 1922, $6 million in bonds was enacted for highway construction. Earthwork technology developed during World War II was used to build roads that could carry heavy guns. This technology then brought to the United States and the Colorado Department of Highways used it to build roads so strong that they could withstand the impact of trucks. The building of sculpture shaped and compacted earth structures as economically and efficiently as possible made trucks transport competitive with railroads. This was done by developing good mechanical earth moving equipment, making it bigger and better and using that equipment in more innovative ways. In the 1860s, most of the transcontinental railroads excavation was done by hand. Flat cars or one horse dump carts were used to haul the material to the fields. Steam shovels were a great leap forward, but flat cars were still used to haul the material to the fill. The operator of this steam shovel is my wife's great grandfather. In the 1930s, shovels became diesel powered and efficiency improved by supplying enough haulers to keep the shovel busy all the time. Through time, the shovels and haulers got bigger and better. Solid rock had to be shot. In the 1930s, only jackhammers were used. Later, wagon drills. Still later, more efficient air tracks. Once drilled, the rock cuts had to be shot. For proportion, notice the shovel at the bottom of the photo and the five air tracks in the middle of the cut. Here, the powder man is wiring in the shot. This is the instant of the shot. A few seconds later, and about a minute later, you can see the results of the shot. Blasting is used in tunneling. These are the supports of the interior of a water tunnel during construction. The completed tunnel with its concrete lining. 49 cats dose material to the fill. Bridges were used to span large water bodies. This is one of two bridges over the Gunnison River at Blue Mesa Reservoir. The steel beams were huge. One bridge is 1,800 feet long, the other is a quarter mile long. Both are 350 feet above the original riverbed. This is the access road to the top of the plateau of the colony shale.